so Laura, why now in terms of longevity? What's happened to make you raise a fund and start investing in research and companies? Yeah, so we think this is um, an insanely important part of the story because if you were Aristotle and you were like trying to start longevity fund, you would have a terrible time. It'd be like <laughs> you know, the worst um, idea. And and so timing is super important. Like why now for the first time in like 2000, 3000 years is it the correct time to work on longevity? To us, a lot of that comes back to tooling and what's available for us to use. Hmm. You know, prior to the 1900s, if you wanted to impact biology, you know, maybe you should have been a physicist, you know, worked on optics, helped make the first microscope. And like Robert Hooke, a physicist, Mm -hmm. um, you know, discovers the cell. So, you know, there's so much that comes from physics and other disciplines into biology to push it forward. But then I think in the 1900s, something kind of fascinating happens, which is that for the first time, there's kind of this acceleration of tooling, right? X-rays, NMR, all these things, you know, the cathode ray tube discovered, mass spectrometry. Um, but, you know, by this guy trying to find the mass of the electron, um, which is so cool. And so all these physics tools start, you know, coming online, but then also more biology-driven tools. And, and so really, I think, you know, and we can get into this more specifically, maybe later time, but kind of what's excited us is just seeing the tools available to characterize, like, life become available for the first time ever, right? You know, for all millennia, you had Darwin and, like, Mendel talk about genetics, and, like, there was no knowledge of what was actually going on at the ground truth level. And in 1953, for the first time, you have, like, the link between molecular biology and, like, what we're looking at with microscopes mm-hmm. and, like, genetics and, like, this, you know, sort of concept of heredity, um, which is just super exciting, um, and what caused you to jump in? Well, I mean, A, I think I was born in like a very lucky time, right? Sort of, yeah. Which I think you always have to be, you know, sort of cautious or like, I guess, like a little bit concerned if you believe that about yourself, right? Like, why now? Like, you know, should it really be the lucky time? But then I think also, you know, as a kid, or A, just like had a lot of relatives that were, you know, sort of aging and, and that was, you know, very striking, but also, you know, really um, wanted to solve cancer. And I was, hmm. I remember talking to my dad about this and I was like, oh, like, I want to solve cancer. And he was like, well, you know, cancer is a subset of aging. So if you want to solve cancer, you just like, you know, solve aging and it, like takes yeah. care of all these other things as well. And that just, you know, that coupled with kind of like hanging off my grandma's, so like, that, that just kind of made sense to me as a kid. I was like, okay, well, like, you know, guess I'll go solve aging then. Like, that's <laughs> the biggest problem. Because cancer is not the number one cause of death in the US, right? It's heart disease, right? Like well, that. I, you yeah. know, there's like if you look at all the age-related diseases, you know, past a certain point are driving kind of like the majority of um, sort of natural deaths, so to speak. So you know, like you know, once we got rid of infectious disease, like it really became the case, like aging, which wasn't previously like necessarily the biggest issue, sort of like rose to the forefront. Yeah. Um, and so that that kind of, I mean, it sort of just I think made sense to like a, a small trial that that was important. Huh. And so why raise a fund rather than you know just go go for curing cancer? <laughs> so so the thinking at the time um, was, you know, possibly in a good way, like emperor has no clothes, like extremely simplistic. Like um, you have to understand. So I was at MIT and I was like a sophomore. Yeah. Um, and I, I was also 16 and I had like maybe a thousand dollars in my bank account. And so like, of, like, you know, knowledge about like the financial industry, like relatively low. My dad had been a public investor. So I kind of knew a lot about like the idea of investing in things like that. That was a generally good thing to do. And I'd worked in like aging labs for maybe four years. And I think the, th- the striking thing was just like there, there was just like no money to like make drugs. And it's kind of hard, you know, like when you're in a lab, you just have like no idea what's going on in the outside world. And hmm. so I would like ask venture capitalists, like I would, you know, call up a few in the phone book and like, you know, a few responded. And so like have these like random conversations and just be like, you know, I'm just I'm curious. I'm a student. Can you like tell me more about like how this industry works? Like, you know, are you funding aging therapeutics? And like none of them had heard of like aging therapeutics. They were kind of like Asian therapeutics. Like what, <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you say? Um, and so that was just very striking that like, Something that I personally believed, like on the technology, like not just like from a mission perspective, like on the technology side was like super exciting, was kind of generally not really like looked at a lot by these folks who are supposedly like the great translators of technology. Um, and then I think also it kind of made sense, like, you know, the first ever mutation found to really extend worm lifespan was 1983. The next was like 1993. And so really the field started about like 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. And so it kind of made sense, like, if you think about like how long it takes for a field to like get traction, like become known, like, okay, there may be like less than a hundred good labs in this space. Maybe like people just like haven't had enough time on like the venture or like investment side to understand that this is like really cool and important. Um, and so like then it kind of made sense that like you 
might want to start a fund if that were the case to like help more drugs kind of get started out of the space. Hmm. So in other words, like the big pharmaceutical companies are not investing in these. They they pilot weren't ideas. they weren't at the time. So things so this are was really like five years ago or something. Yeah. <laughs> seven years ago, yeah. So things have really changed. You know, seven years ago there were like maybe like three companies have been started or so that had like the aging brand on them. Yeah. There was like zero people in shit. Like Arch Ventures was like, one of the few that were like taking risks. Um there's like maybe 10 million invested like that year in total into like the space. Right. And like in the past four years we've had like 10 billion plus um, we now see like 300 companies per year. So it's, I mean, it's, it's just really changed. Like it, it's very, very striking to have watched it go from like wow. zero to like what it is today. Yeah, now it's totally a trend. Yeah. Hopefully it sticks around. Uh, so yeah. you have a, a, not a million, but many questions for you. I think like the top of the list for me is what you do personally. Ah, yes, this is uh, um, probably the most common question. Yeah. Um, and I think all my friends will always say that I answer this terribly um, because I, you know, I'm kind of like, a, a, you know, I come from a semi-scientific background and so like really like to get like to the ground truth of things. And it's just really hard. Like there's just like a million, like if you start reading mouse studies on longevity, like you will find mouse studies that say like if you decrease, like they, they've done this like really cool experiment where if you take fat and sugar and and um, protein and you decrease the level of each of them to keep a total calorie intake the same, you can kind of test like which component of diet is like contributing to longevity. And they did this and they like did kind of like a full matrix and they did like lifespan studies for each of like the different proportions. Yeah. And what they found from that study in mice was that like decreasing protein was the number one kind of thing that increased longevity. Um, and so from that, you might infer that like maybe less protein is good. But at the same time, it doesn't seem like, you know, maybe if you work out a lot, that would be different. Um, and so I, I've come to the conclusion that kind of like, you know, I have some theses about like what is good and what is not good. Um, but it, it just as a scientist, it's really hard to say that there's kind of like a good kind of like real kind of like hypo- hypothesis there. Okay. And so. So I'm sure like not not a lot of like, like not just despite like reading probably more papers on this than like most people in the world. Yeah. It, it really is something where. um I, I don't see things that I think are extremely clear kind of like uh, move, movers for longevity uh, on, on like the diet level, obviously that like aren't confounded by other things. So what's your diet? Um, I, well, I've tried a variety of things. I think right now it's just kind of like the sort of like bare minimal, like try to eat low sugar, um, personally trying low protein, um, just because I think that is somewhat supported by kind of like the literature. Yeah. Um, and uh, but lo- low protein is like a gram per kilogram per day. Um, I think just sort of like, uh, not, it's, it's a good question. It's like, what, what is the correct per person? And also if you exercise, yeah. um, I actually once tried to calculate out if you exercise, like how much protein would be required to like replenish like all of your myosin and actin proteins. Yeah. And it's kind of fascinating. I think that there might actually be like, you know, up to a hundred fold increase in power, like in your muscles where like, if they all fired at the same time, you get like, you know, sort of a lot of power, but any, um, but I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I just, I don't have any strong recommendations on diet. Like I, I really like, I, I've read basically all the studies. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe low protein, low sugar, um, are both good. Like intermittent fasting seems to be like somewhat supported. Um, are you doing that? Uh, I, I've tried it. I think it's kind of hard to maintain if you like, you know, have a graduating sleep cycle. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, I wish I had better recommendations for, for that, for that area. Okay. And in terms of supplements, are you doing anything? Um, you know, there's a variety of people who recommend everything from NAD plus all the way through to like metformin, um, for the kind of the more adventurous. Um, I think that, so we actually have a secret list at the fund of like on market drugs and things that we think based on like our like body of evidence yeah. might be having an impact on lifespan and we're, we're monitoring them. Some of them I personally think would be like intriguing to take. We don't release that list just because we were afraid that if we did and kind of like somebody acted on it and kind of like didn't work out well for them, that should be like a, you know, a terrible thing to do to yeah. like them. Um, but we have a secret list of things that we think are like interesting. Okay. Um, and I, but and I think for the ND plus though, there's, there's some evidence of like positive effect there, but we haven't seen great lifespan studies showing like a large increase in lifespan. So like that'd be like my, my one concern there. Okay. Cool. Because yeah, in, in the, the worm and mouse studies, there have been yeah. like, you know, a hundred percent increase in lifespan, right? With certain uh, so so worm studies, um, we've gotten up to tenfold reported. Um, you know, possibly more. Um, that's by decreasing a gene product, though. So that's kind of like if you want to go and take a gene therapy, or we had such a thing, um, you, know, po- you know, from birth, possibly like that would work. Um, but but probably the effect would be a lot smaller. Um, in mice, we've got about it up to a twofold increase, and that was a combination of, of okay. a mutation and uh, restricting the total caloric intake of the mouse. Okay, down to what? That's relative, what, I, yeah. I don't remember for that study. On average, I think people will do CR uh, to about thirty percent of normal caloric intake, um, mm-hmm. but it really varies. So if you take forty different, and this is where it gets complicated, yeah. you take forty different genetically different strains of mice, and you change their diet in the same way, half will live shorter, 
and half will live longer. And so, you know, I used to, like, as a counselor, I was like, oh, you know, like there's a simple answer. Yeah. And I think that there is, um, but I think it is a lot more sort of reliant on genetics and other things than um, we'd like to think. Um, hmm. How long have your family family members lived? Like, How long have my yeah. family members lived? Uh, your grandparents, um, great grandparents. Uh, well, my grandma is still going. She's she's in her mid mid nineties. Um, it's a good sign. Yes, exactly. So they, they they've all lived, you know, ab- about age eighty or above. So you know, hopefully, hopefully. How, how about yourself? How long is your your family? Uh, not person? ninety. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I need it more than you. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> what 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 would you say the number one health hack that you'd recommend to your your audience would be? I mean, well. I mean, I've done a little bit of blood work, so everything is kind of anecdotal and based on feel. Yeah. But I was vegetarian for eight years. Oh, interesting. For environmental reasons. And then I realized huh. that I, I had like developed this entire vocabulary around cheating. Uh, so, for example, if I was traveling, it was like cultural meat. And it was it was allowed. Uh, and then, That's you know, funny. if I was like, you know, over over your house and like you made chicken or something, I'd be like, eh, whatever, I'll have it. Um, I see. And at the point where it was like twice a month, I was like, I'm not vegetarian anymore. So then I started uh, eating more protein, uh, but really just more eggs. Yeah. And then I felt a lot better. But really, the main thing is sleep. Like yeah, prioritizing no, that, that makes sense. I will say that actually one thing that's interesting on the the health spend front, I think people have this like intuition that when they feel better, that's a metric, that's a metric for something that's good for them. Yeah, I think it's actually not true. So if you look like a lot, to some extent, like you know, maybe you want to optimize like robust, very cheerful lifespan, in which case like like tautologically it is. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, or a lot of the time, when you uh, see our mice or you do other things like make them live longer, so total number of years increases, they're not kind of like as happy on a day-to-day basis like they're a little bit thinner a little bit more lethargic in some cases so i think it's kind of like you know whenever someone says like i really feel better because i'm doing x i'm always like oh gosh like i wonder if that's like the correct thing like maybe maybe not hard to say when people talk about health span in my mind it's very correlated to how i feel right like if i was going to do caloric restriction and every day would suck for 90 years i would opt out (laughs) Uh, i mean i don't know if there's a drug i for instance like i know a lot of people who have experimented with like keto and other random diets and they're yeah. just caffeinated to the gills. <laughs> like there's low energy. <laughs> that's I mean, so funny. That's one thing you can do. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. But one thing I've been curious about like there seems to be relatively limited data on actual humans. Yes. So how how might someone set up a study? Is it even possible now, or is everything so well, regulated? So there is this fellow near Barzilai who's working on what's called the the Tame trial, and the point of that is to assay the effects of uh, this drug metformin, which is a very old diabetes drug, yeah. on um, sort of markers or biomarkers of aging that he has kind of like put forward. And the cost for that will be about sixty million dollars. And if people do it, the idea would be, okay, well here's our first pass at testing aging in humans, and so finally we have some more data. The way that trial was um, sort of uh, motivated was there was this kind of large finding that in hundreds of thousands of patients, or I think about actually 70,000 in that population, um, from kind of like a UK study, if you look retrospectively, people who had been taking metformin for decades, they had um, apparently like a little bit better kind of health span. So they had less age-related disease. The diabetics did on this drug, even then they're kind of like non-diabetic counterparts who were hmm. not taking metformin. And so I think, that, you know, hard to say that study is like kind of like definitive evidence, um, but that kind of motivated all this sort of question asking of, you know, could we uh, really nail down in humans a trial to like test, uh, you know, met- metformin in particular? That said, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of biologists will really kind of, you know, say, oh, it's very important to test things in humans. And of course it is. Yeah. If we could do that, we would be doing it kind of all over the place. Um, but I think increasingly over the years, and maybe it's just like I started out in worm biology, I'm kind of like more and more excited about like the animal kingdom. Um, like, you know, the animal kingdom is just like absolutely awesome. Like we have one company um, in our, you know, current sort of, you know, sort of portfolio that's working on this and they're amazing, you know, fauna. Um, but kind of like, it, it's like, we, there's such diversity of phenotypes, right? And like, how can we learn from other animals as opposed to just like our lowly selves? Because like, you know, for example, there's naked mole rats and rats, right? Like naked mole rats are pushing 30 on lifespan. Like we have no idea how long they live. Like their mortality rate at 30 is not going up. Hmm. So we're just like watching these guys, like waiting for them to start dying. And then like rats, which have like very similar physiology, um, live maybe like three to four years. And so what on earth is different between these two animals, right? Yeah. Like, like that's just absolutely fascinating. I think it's also important because, like, you know, you, you a lot of, like, you know, physicists and mathematicians, um, and I used to be this way, like, we're always worried, what if there's, like, an inherent, like, limitation on, like, a complexity level? Or, like, what if, given a certain complex system, a certain rate of metabolism, like, you have to die because there's some kind of, like, you know, 
sort of theory about like entropy increasing over time and that like you know must yeah. drive and just like too complex to, like really intervene but then like you know these animals are basically the same size like have so like so many other similarities like it would just be very hard to maintain like that theory and also accept this kind of like large differential longevity yeah absolutely so someone asked a question that i thought was kind of funny uh yeah here we go so uh micah asks basically do you think immortality is going to be achieved by curing all diseases so in other words like living forever or yeah. like what's going to happen first that or are we going to just upload our consciousness to a computer <laughs> and live forever that way i think that um so that that is a question that i used to get very interested in cause sort of like well you know if you really care about this like you'd be working on kind of like the biology the yeah time. where do you work yeah exactly i think so the way the the way i kind of think about it which is not a good answer but it's kind of like a framework for thinking about this question is i think about biology like a set of tools right um so you and, and, and you can you can kind of see this in like the, the the kind of like um things that have become available recently for us to um use to affect human health and what i mean by that is like you know prior to like you know, the 1900s or really, like even like just the 1980s or maybe like the 1930s, but like the first time you, you really put this marker, if you wanted to make a drug, it was like a small molecule, right? Like it was like, you got a plant, you found something from a plant that was useful, yeah. or you like put some solve in a wound, which we, we realized that's a bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> not very, not very good for sterility. Um, but there are always things that you would do, but then like, you know, in the, in the 20th century, for the first time, we use like proteins, you know, insulin or antibodies created by like our own bodies or, you know, the bodies of like the mice that like we kind of, you know, cloned them in um, to treat disease. And so we actually use something that came from life to treat, you know, kind of like a living organism. We now just in the past kind of three years have like landmark approvals and viruses being used to like hmm. blow up cancer. Literally, like these are called oncolytic viruses. Um, there's new drugs uh, using genetically engineered cells. You've probably heard of, you know, CAR T and kind of like this whole kind of immune oncology phenomenon. Also stem cells being used. And so I think kind of like the final frontier of all of that, like use of kind of like biology's own system to do cool stuff is the brain and understanding kind of like that system. But I think to lead up to that, you kind of will yeah. do so many things that it may be the case that like we kind of get there at the same time, right? So, you know, like that's like the final frontier and we solve it, but kind of like along the way, we've also kind of like done enough work on the, the other tooling kind of fronts that we get kind of like to a, a kind of... um you know, maybe we don't solve kind of like lifespan itself, but like longevity is definitely impacted by kind of like the work up to that, up to that time. Right, exactly. And and do you sense that there's like a strong signal at this point as to what might be the way that we, you know, a, a bunch of people ask these questions, but like, you know, <laughs> increasing lifespan, like 20%, like right, if yeah. you had to put money on it, obviously you literally put money on it. Yes. Like what would be the most likely thing to take off? The most likely thing to take in, off? In, in the next, I don't know, 50 years. So, so, so here's how we think about it. Like, we have extremely strong confidence that it's possible to impact lifespan between, like, you know, three months to maybe 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, obviously, like, you know, different probabilities um, with what we have to. In fact, we're, we're pretty certain that there are some things in the clinic already or on the market um, that with some probability are impacting lifespan. Right. Like, okay. lifespan seems to be very malleable. Um, you know, to a small degree. I think the larger question is, like, well, you know, A, how many of those can you like put together to like get kind of the maximal impact from like that first wave? And then B, our thesis is that none of those things will be sufficient on their own to result in like an engineered lifespan. So you have this first wave of things that like kind of work, but like they're kind of limited. Like they have kind of like a, yeah. maybe like 60% and that's like the max. Um, so then the question is like, how can you like go above that? And we think that really all comes back to tooling. And so that's where I don't know if I'm, you know, we're Aristotle or kind of like we're more like Newton or like maybe like in the best case scenario, we're like Einstein or yeah. like, you know, of someone today in, in the realm of physics in terms of like going to the moon or like you've tried to go to the moon kind of like 1600s would be a little bit hard um, or recently maybe a, a little bit easier. But like, I think that's where we have, we have some hope and optimism, but we're not as confident that there are things today that we'd point to to say that's going to result in kind of like unbounded engineered ability to kind of like impact longevity. And okay. that's why we also really care about, about tools when we think about like investing in the space, not just kind of the first wave of like awesome therapies that will be available sooner, but like maybe aren't as kind of like engineerable. Right. So you're kind of hedging if this is still a foundational stage. Right. Exactly. I, I think we'd love to think that it is. And like, yeah, I of think, course. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like 1953, my argument for foundational stage would be like, this is the first time ever in history that we have the link between genetics and molecular biology. Like mm -hmm. that happened in 1953. That's pretty landmark. Maybe it's been 70 years. So you're like, well, what happened in 70? You know, couldn't it just have happened like right after 1953? But I, I think that'd be the argument for like that's why today makes sense from a like engineering perspective. Okay. Um, hmm. And then ethically, you know, Ryan Hoover asked like about the ethics of longevity. Another uh, Jack Fernandez asked like, do people want to actually want to live longer. Like, right. Do you do you have strong <laughs> opinions on this, or are you kind uh, of yes. you know, stepping back? So we get we get asked about this 
all the time. And it was funny because when I started the fund, I never thought that people would like, ask those questions. Yeah. You, because to me, the reason you thought it was assumed. Well, because the reason we started the fund was to cure like things like cancer and oh. Alzheimer's. And so like from our perspective, like, well, you know, like you would never ask, like, is it good to cure cancer? Like no one would ever ask that question that I've heard of, or maybe some people would. Um, but then we realized that like the, when people think longevity, they think about it as different than those things. And mm-hmm. so I think like, you know, from our perspective, like the, I just, um, you know, I, I think it makes sense to cure like these diseases if we can. Um, and so we, we definitely want to do that. And so like, you know, we would never deviate from kind of our mission. I think, you know, from a broader scale, it's kind of like two camps of like, do you want to be like Malthusian and you're thinking of kind of like, you know, the world is like a bounded place. Like, yeah. you know, it's really like limited resources or like kind of like David Deutschian, like, you know, like, you know, we're on, you know, spaceship earth, but like, no, we're not actually like, let's go and like explore the cosmos and kind of like unlimited resources, you know, like en- energy is like in all matter. Um, I think like just like kind of like from a, like philosophical standpoint, I'm more on the kind of the latter uh, sort of camp. I, was, yeah. I just like that kind of viewpoint a little bit better. Um, but yeah, I, I think to us, like just the, the like the the rationale for longevity really was let's curate related diseases. How do you do that? You work on aging. Hmm. And yeah, maybe there are multiple universes where we live. <laughs> right. uh, I'm trying to get David on the podcast. Uh, that yeah. would be I met him, so. I met him one time when we talked about it. And really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Would you have to like go to him and his That's house? That's what and- I did when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best interview ever. Uh, yeah, he did one with Sam Harris. So it was kind of cool. Oh my gosh. Um, but but really, like in terms of having an actual opinion on this, so there was a cool one um, on the ethics. Mike asked. Uh, how would immortality change society? Wouldn't we become more complacent since we have to, uh, quote, forever to do things? Wouldn't that diminish our rate of innovation? And since less new individuals are being created, we would have less access to new ideas. In other words, like, uh, there are fewer Newtons, fewer Einsteins. And and sort of this is like yeah. why the, the basic income argu- or one of the basic income arguments, right? right? We allow for these people to succeed. Well, so I, I think there are two implicit assumptions there. One is that we understand how people are motivated. And that their motivation stems from this feeling that, like, they will die. Yeah. Um, and I think number two is this idea that, like, um, people have an innate kind of rate of loss of new ideas with age, kind of innate, like, loss of openness. Um, and so I think, that, you know, addressing both of those, on the first point, um, and I, and I think they're kind of valid questions, I, I don't, I just, I, I, I don't think that that's true personally. Like, I don't think that, like, I'm motivated to do things because, like, I know that I'm going to die. Like, I think that, well, I mean, I, you know, Perhaps everyone know. else is, and this is just kind of like a personal thing, but like, you know, I think I'm motivated by many things like curiosity, competition, um, sort of like, you know, personal growth, kind of like wanting to be like better next year than like, you know, was today, kind of like a sense of mission and importance, kind of like, you know, it's important to go do certain things. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I think if you ask most people, I, you know, maybe they'd have different answers, but I just, you know, I, I'm curious if like death re- really is like the core kind of like motivator to do things, um, you know, for, kind of for everyone in the world. It's like that, that's one thing. It might result in fewer people wanting to go to war, which might be problematic if you kind of like want yeah. more war and more soldiers, uh, or, or not if you would like less war. Um, so I think that, that'd be an interesting thing. But I, I think for that question, I just I don't I don't agree that we we really understand like the core motivation of everyone on this planet, and that that is by its sort of definition um, the the fear of death. Um, I think the other thing that's interesting is um, sort of to the second point, um, uh, the question of like loss of ideas with age. You know, there there is a lot of like just cognitive like change with age, which is very fascinating, right? And sort of like you know biologically, you do change, and like you know part of what we like really want to do, you know, is impact aging. But like a large part of it, like if we could just make a cognitive enhancer, yeah. so you were like sharp until you're nine, and then you you know dropped, like that would be equally like that to us would be like an awesome product in and of itself. Like just cognitive enhancement, like alone would be great. Um, and so I think I think actually people are kind of like undercounting the value of potentially you know, if you're a Newton, absolutely brilliant. And you help develop a field and maintain your 20 year old openness and kind of like fluidity for 100 years. all the way through to age 90. Yeah. Like, what insane kind of ideas would Newton be coming up with at age 90? Yeah. Like, with that kind of openness. The counter argument there was like, well, he would just go and do alchemy. And so then you have like, you know, young Newton being great and then like old Newton like doing alchemy. The counter, counter argument is like, well, maybe alchemy like caused the decline in, in thinking because like he was sniffing too much mercury. <laughs> so I, I mean, want counter argument. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You almost won an argument for like outsider scientists who don't get discovered until they die. And then they have like a, a hundred years. <laughs> <laughs> of portfolio. Right. I mean, and, and they're also just, I mean, like so many people, um, like, you know, some incredible physicists at Stanford who are still amazing and coming up with extremely novel ideas and like, you know, Hawking publishing on like black holes and entropy, yeah, right? Yeah. Like his final paper, yeah. like on this completely novel, fascinating field. Yeah. And like, was that like, you know, was he declining? Would we like Hawking to kind of like step aside for like the younger generation? Like, can't we have both, I guess would be a question. Interesting. So would you be a proponent of like, you know, giving the entire, or like similar, like fluoride in the water, putting like pro <laughs> 
in the water? Um, I think that I'm never a fan of things that don't involve individual choice. So anything that like would be sort of a coercive or kind of like enforcement, then like no. But I mean, so sort of, like if everyone will like, sign up for it, then like um, I do think that you know there's like all this fascinating work on like cognitive enhancement, like just starting to come out today. And and that's, a, I mean, we've seen a lot of companies that we're super excited about that have to do with kind of like, you know, making your neurons kind of like make more science so like increasing their like rate of um, your division or, you know, hypothetically, I think that area is a little bit contentious, but you know, like that to us is kind of like, that's part of longevity. And mm-hmm. like, if we just had a pill for like cognitive enhancement, um, you know, that, that, that in itself would be like absolutely wonderful. Like limitless. Yeah. yeah I mean, everything I've tried, it's, yeah, it works. There are some times where you get this feeling that you're, you know, you're really good at like you're crushing email, but you're not like the, the <laughs> right, most like yes. creative, and you're just like sweating the whole day, not coming <laughs> up with the deep thoughts. Yeah, yeah. It's actually fascinating. Have you ever read this book, um, Daily Habits? No. I would actually recommend. I think you might like it. It's um uh, the daily habits of um, mostly writers and artists. Okay. Um, but it's super fascinating because it details kind of like how they live their life. And it's it's just extremely variable. But the most common thing is that they all wake up and go to sleep. They have a very set routine. Um, and when they wake up, do work and go to sleep. I'm already on that cycle. Um, (laughs) yeah. I mean, what, a thing I have found is that my, um, my mornings are just much more valuable than my evenings, especially in the middle of the day. Like I'm just kind of useless. So I just work out at like two in the afternoon. I'm curious why that is. Like it's either biological or psychological, right? Sort of like, you know, you get like too much loaded into your brain that you don't want to think or it'd be really fascinating if sleep played a key role there right where sort of like sleep does something biologically and perhaps psychologically that like somehow induces like an optimal state like right when you wake up but yeah have you tried it like sleeping in the middle of the day and then just getting back to work i haven't but that's an interesting idea yeah i'm curious what that would do possible interest yeah I'm, I'm so curious about cognitive enhancement we did a podcast with uh, rosalind watts who is oh. at imperial about psychedelics oh that's um, awesome. awesome i mean it's it's very similar uh, actually her research with um robin carhart harris at imperial is in michael pollan's book did oh you read interesting that? no i did i've heard so much about it though yeah it's really great but i mean it's kind of like cognitive han- enhancement in a very broad sense in right. terms of like trying to break you out of your old habits and like have more confidence increase openness and yeah exactly um and so are you are you taking anything to like any in the nootropic sense <laughs> nootropic consistently sense? um no i think i don't even do caffeine because the general thought is like try to wean yourself off of everything kind of and, like if you can perform great there then like perhaps someday like there'll be a safe drug that comes on market that's that's worth worth trying huh. but um yeah, I'm also like, I, I like Marcus Aurelius, like stoicism, like the idea of kind of like, you know, none of the necessary things, but like maybe that's the application of that philosophy now that I think about it. Yeah, some part of that just makes me angry. Like, I just, like, really? I want to, well, it's like it all, you know, kind of like the caloric, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a dichotomy, like it's, a, it's all stretched apart because I'm very much a creature of habit. Okay. That being said, I like caloric restriction not having like a beer with my friends, like all of this stuff. Uh, I, see. I just like, yeah. don't, I'm not doing it. I'd rather, huh. I'd rather work out an extra time. But then, but then some people say like, that's bad for your heart. Right. You know, like right. you, 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 you can't win. You yeah. can't win. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like in some ways it's like the devil I know. And huh. I just avoid other vices like texting while driving and smoking. <laughs> that's interesting. Hmm. Hmm. What is like the thing that you do that you're the most proud of? Like the habit that is like the hardest for you to maintain that you nevertheless are kind of like quite happy to like be able to do. I mean, exercise is no problem because I go yeah. crazy. I go crazy without doing it. Right. Uh, I think what's consistently the hardest to maintain is giving energy to the side projects that are creatively demanding oh that's interesting because i this is what i didn't expect i used to work for myself and now i work at yc and um obviously and (laughs) uh there are obviously like you have you have so much energy in the day and obviously you can like push harder and get work done and like be more disciplined um but i found that like there are certain side project ideas that are just kind of like too much to even think about. Oh, interesting. And so I'm, yeah, like when I, when I make progress on that, I'm, I'm very happy with myself because cool. the, the side projects that are like, you know, I've like made like little SAS tools and stuff and, and that's cool, but it's definitely not the hardest thing. 
And what like allows you to make progress on those projects? Uh, just internal motivation, like wanting to do it. I think mm-hmm. the uh, what's always helpful is just imagine imagine yourself in ten years and like look back. Oh, interesting. And then just use that as a metric for like what you wanna. Would you be proud of yourself for having done that? That seems like somewhat like the the Bezos framework of like you know when you're 60 and you kind of look back on your life. Yeah, that's interesting. But then. But it's, dude, it's like, who's to say what's going to lead to the next thing that's great? So, like, you know, all right. So before we did the podcast, like I was talking about working at The Onion, right? Right. And now I'm here. Yeah. And you're like, that's not a standard trajectory. Right. So you can't really say authoritatively, like, the best way to spend your time is X. Um, but when I uh, when I was a kid... Uh, someone said to me, like, before you start working on something, think about what winning looks like. And that's kind of a framework for projects for me. Oh, that's interesting. Um, but I don't know. That's huh. just a personal thing. What other, like, hacks and motivations, like, do you have in your arsenal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I just don't spend time with people that annoy me or, like, stress me out. Okay. Yeah, that seems uh, like a reasonable That's a one. positive thing. Um, I, uh, am never busy, but I, I'm fine using that excuse. Oh, I you're always, never busy. I always have time for my friends and like the huh. things I really want to do. And I just cut everything else out. So I don't know. How about you? That makes, mm, hacks and motivations. Um, I think it's like always trying to keep the baseline pretty, pretty low. Like kind of, you know, like, yeah. Like, I, I think, like, you can you can control, like, your output, but you can't really control, like, how the world responds to it. So it's kind of, like, if you're just, like, all right, if I do good output, then, like, that's great. And then, like, however the world responds, like, can't control it. But, like, like being really happy when you do stuff that you can control is, I think, probably the biggest, like, mental hack for... Because, I mean, you you, like, you just can't control. It's so hard because you're, you're still pretty... Young. How old are you? 20? Uh, 24. Yeah, yeah. So I remember when I just moved out here, I... Um, how old were you then? uh 23 oh interesting like. and you just come out of college or yeah so what happened was um i was in new york for college and then i lived there for like a couple years afterwards and uh my girlfriend and i split up and i was like i'd always wanted to live in california and new york was just like <laughs> <laughs> just like grinding at me and so i just moved out here oh interesting um, wow which has been cool and so when i like, did you have a job or something or just like moved out so the onion moved from New York to Chicago oh. and almost everyone left. And so I started a company with my friends huh. and we were doing these hackathons where developers and comedians made stuff together. And it's like, okay, that's it was cool. a total not startup, total small business, <laughs> super fun. Yeah. And uh, we did one with Twitter. And so I moved out here for that thinking I would be out here for like months. Right. And now it's like whatever, six years later. Um, but what about California was like so different for you that you had to stay here? Well, I love doing the outdoor stuff, uh, for sure. Okay. Uh, but it's a trade. I don't know. Everyone wants to talk shit both ways and it's totally a trade. Um, culturally it's not the same thing as New York, but then if you're working in like tech, this is where, or entertainment stuff. I mean, New York's kind of a mix, uh, but there's LA. Um, it just seems so much, so much more professional. Not in like the polished sense, yeah. but like everyone is, or like most people are here. And that's cool. That was cool to me. Like going to these like, you know, coffee shops and seeing, you know, this person that I had only seen on the internet before. <laughs> uh, and I was like, man, all this shit's happening here. That's interesting. Um, but I don't know. How do you think these have changed? And also, sorry, I don't want to like to, but how do you think no, these have changed like good. in the past seven years? Like, or I guess... Has it been seven years for you or? Something like that. Yeah. What has been the biggest thing that's changed? Like I either both positive or negatively or neutrally. In myself or in uh, the. In like the environment that you've seen from like. Oh well, yeah. Well, when that's you first easy. Out here, oh, that's super easy. Yeah. Uh, tech is uh, completely vilified. That's been the biggest shift. Oh interesting. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's like if it's not this next election it's the one afterwards. Like tech is the evil thing. Interesting. Um, yeah. And what did you see what drove that or kind of. Um, hmm. Well, in some ways, it's like a, an incredible amount of wealth being accrued to a small amount of people. Uh, they're young, and I think their amount of power is just off putting. 
to so many folks. Oh, I obviously see. with the Facebook thing it's and kind of like, like Gerard, like you have like the person to vilify and it just feels like the new banker to me. And uh, that's the yes, that's been the shift. It's like not a great precedent in general. Yeah, I don't know. Because have you noticed anything? Um. Honestly, I think it's kind of head like in bio. It's just you know, no, no one pays attention to bio. Like yeah. we're just all the way over here, kind of like you know, working on things that take a really long time and are very like hard and expensive. And some people are like, oh, you know, they're still over there, like still working on drugs. Um, and so I don't, I don't think there's as much. And there are like very few. Weirdly, there are very few billionaires in biotech. I think this is something that was very hmm. striking to me when I first came out. I sort of like I was looking for people who were amazing and also had made like a lot of capital. And biotech is like those are the people who like would be successful and like know how to build business as well. At least was my thought. And there were very few of them. A lot of them were in VC hmm. who had invested in these companies. So I was like, where are the founders not getting the capital that like, how does that equation work? Um, and then I think uh, one of them was like a, a former salesman. It's like the most informative meeting I ever had about sales. Where he was just like, because I was trying to understand like, how do you sell a business or an idea? And like, you know, you know from MIT, it's like, you know, complicated, like read a textbook about it and like, yeah. write it. and he was like, you just sit the person down and tell them what to do. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Okay, now I think I understand how this like whole area of like life, you know, like, what, what, how to communicate a little bit better than I did previously. That's so funny. Yeah, I really hope more of these companies. I mean, they're they are popping up already. Like yeah. you've seen longevity biotech. Um, and if there is any kind of lull in the ecosystem, it's just going to be like fertile ground. What well, cool companies? I, I think there was like there there's been historically a lack of like founder driven companies. Yeah, and like obviously the funding environment has changed to make that like more likely to happen like the next couple of years. Yeah, but it's just so striking. Like it really is different when you have like because you like I think if you look at like the wealth created in tech and in biotech, it's like you really see the distribution you know going so much more to venture capital I think than to founders. And that was just that's just been like really those are really weird thing to kind of like observe on like first coming here. Sort of like why is that the case? Do you have different terms than normal VC funds? Well, I mean, I, I for 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 our funds. Yeah, I mean, if that's a like a strong <laughs> opinion you have, like, what are what are your terms? Yeah, I mean, like, well, by definition, like, you know, we have H one, which is like, you know, similar to kind of what what you folks are working on, like, you know, that that's founder driven. That's like, you know, sort of trying to get people, you know, sort of leg up and and promote kind of like grad students, postdocs as the founders and the company, and like not try to replace them. Yeah. Um, I guess like like kind of um some other firms, which I think is a, a you know a fair strategy if like that's you know, sort of, you know, something that, that's been your bulwark for, like, uh, decades. But, um, I mean, I think Mark would say it's similar to what's happened in software, right? Like, you know, you had this first wave of kind of, like, professional managers. You had kind of, like, a swing back to technologists. You had kind of, like, a swing back to the middle of kind of, like, now we'd like some more managers, please. But, like, you know, still technologists are kind yeah. of driving the show. And I think in bio, we might be kind of, like, midway through that. We're kind of, like, we've had, like, the managers period for a long time. We might have more technologists. Um, and then, like, maybe kind of, like, swing back to the middle. But that's, like, a pretty simple pattern match. Like, you know, who knows what will really happen in the future. Hmm. Yeah, because the that's interesting. If it's a trailing thing from software, because you probably know it's right. yeah. So what's happened now is like maybe ten years ago or, or when YC started, it was incredibly rare for you to be able to just like pitch an idea. Get exactly. Funny. Yes. Now you can easily do that. But yes. more importantly, you can I mean, I hear crazy numbers from people leaving college and going to work at Facebook or right. big yep. companies. And I think that's like overall probably bad for the ecosystem because yep. it like it encourages this like extreme risk aversion. Right. And I think the the likelihood of lifestyle inflation and never starting something is high. But think about so what enabled uh, YC, right? AW sorry. Yeah. I mean, AWS from the outside a huge part of it, right? Like the the first ever ability driven by tooling to kind of spin something point. up really cheaply. And that's I think in point. bio, and this is like what, what everyone talks about, sort of like, you know, there really was this point where like, you know, drop in cost of sequencing has been occurring over the past like, you know, 18 years. But really up until like the past three or four years, you could not get a thousand dollar genome, right? Like that is a recent phenomenon. And hmm. so like, what argument would be like, you know, look at like Illumina's revenues, um, you know, like today, it's absolutely crazy how some of the are like Intel's revenues, like right in the 1970s. Or like, like the parallel there is like extremely, and this, this is due like you know a, a friend of mine, um, Nate, who like noticed this, but kind of like you know, there, there's just like this really striking parallel between like the enabler of technology that we kind of see, you know, in kind of like one one segment, yeah. and then kind of like what's happening in bio today, um, and who knows what will happen in the future, but like, there is an interesting parallel there. Hmm. Huh. Do you think there are people in labs? Well, actually, like what percentage of people working in labs do you think want to start companies? 
So this is the fascinating thing. So we were we were curious about this because if you look at the amount of funding that's available on the venture side to go into biotech in the past couple of years, yeah. it's insanely, I mean, it, it's doubled, tripled in the past couple of years oh. alone. But the number of companies funded has stayed fairly constant. And so we're just looking at this like, what the heck is happening here, right? And what's yeah. happened is like the number on the top end of like the median hasn't even changed. It's like the top end of court, like the top quarter of companies are getting more capital per company. So it's like all this capital has come from LPs because you've seen like, you know, the, the NASDAQ biotech index, you know, go from like stagnant, you know, right. up until 2011 to like montonically increasing or with different of a small dip. And then it's like, where do you put all this capital? You, there are no more companies to invest in. And so we were like, well, why are more people not starting companies? We went and talked to like 100 grad students and postdocs. And the answer they gave us was like absolutely striking. It was like most of them. So maybe like, you know, 10% were worried about reputation risk. Like they didn't want to leave, fail, and then go back. 80% had never thought about the idea of starting a company. Like they just were not aware that it was, you know, a possibility. And so you could argue, okay, maybe that's like they're not entrepreneurial. But, you know, if you think about like, you know, in the 80s or the 90s, like would you have gone as a CS student at Stanford and like start something? Maybe. But like maybe you'd have a lot higher of a barrier or bar to doing that, right? I think that's part of why, why she started to make that process easier. Hmm. And so I think really what we've seen is like it's just a lack of education you know, and, and kind of like just availability of options to these people, yeah. like, which is like, makes you so angry, right? Like, you know, like you should never be forced or kind of like convinced to do something that you don't want to or that's not good for you. Like you, you should be aware of your options. Like how are all these smart people not aware of like all the possibilities that are out there for them? I mean, it's the, I think the saddest slash funniest one I've heard is when someone often in like a hard science, uh, like lab or background, they learn about YC and then think that we're just giving them loans. And they're like, oh, no, I can never do that. <laughs> oh, that- and, yeah, which is like, I mean, I don't know. If you had, oh, ne- so had no exposure to this, like, why wouldn't you think that? I mean, like, and all of these myths exist. But I think the education thing is a good point. For the most part, people don't even know. That's absolutely crazy. Yeah. So you should talk about your, I mean, you have, dude, you have so many questions. Um, <laughs> but you should also maybe mention your project with Daniel. If, cause that's relevant. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, super excited. So, um, uh, my friend, uh, Daniel Gross started this, um, really, really awesome, um, sort of project called Pioneer. Um, and, and what Pioneer is, is it's trying to find like the lost Einsteins of the world, which yeah. I think is like an awesome tagline. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think Danny has a, a fascinating background in that. Like he, um, you know, was kind of on track to join like the Israeli army and then, you know, uploaded a kind of ap- application to YC. Yeah. And, and you know, like basically like his whole life changed after like one flight out here and a meeting with like, you know, Paul Graham and Cove, sort of like this, you know, He's now this incredibly successful person, but kind of like, you know, would he have had the same chance if not for like a lucky, you know, I think his dad forged him like an article about YC, like that was how I found out about it, right? Really? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, I mean, that, I think that's one, the one thing you mentioned. So it's like, okay. there's this coincidence that kind of drove his journey. And so the question is like, you know, how many people are, are there out there that like with a small intervention could like, yeah. you know, drastically have like a different life course? And so Pioneer, uh, sort of Pioneer.app is this place where if you're anybody in the world and you have a project you want to work on, you can apply. And it can be anything, anywhere from kind of like, I want to have more of my high school friends do like science stuff all the way through to like, I'm 80 and I finally want to write my novel. Um, and, uh, you know, you, there's this thing called the Pioneer Tournament where people work for about 30 days, kind of, you know, do their projects and kind of like the community votes like on their kind of like most uh, kind of you know favorite people. And then kind of based on that. Um, at the end, you know, a set of people are selected to like be flown to San Francisco. They receive about like a five thousand dollar grant, and they kind of like join the pioneer community, which is kind of like this you know set of really ambitious outsiders trying to change the world. Um, and so I resonated this because like you know my personal story was coming from um, New Zealand yeah. at age twelve. You know, based on like a random email I sent to like a professor here, and it was the first email I ever sent to like someone who was on a family member, and she responded. But if she mm-hmm. hadn't responded, and like that luck hadn't occurred, then like you know where would I be? I have no idea. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I think it's just like Pioneer is so exciting because it might help a lot. And everyone who's listening, like you should definitely, definitely apply Pioneer.app. Um, cause it just, you know, I think it unlocks so much potential of like everyone in the world who like could be doing awesome things. I think it's so cool. Yeah. Just enabling people to like have the, the, the confidence thing has been the biggest surprise for me at YC. Like, oh, interesting. I think a, a huge unspoken part of why YC is successful is that it gives people the confidence to do their thing. Right. And they're often like, I mean, sometimes it's insider, you know, like tracked, like I went to Stanford, whatever. Uh, but sometimes it's like total outsider people and it works out. And I think that like, yeah, man, without systems that give people that, that little extra push, a lot of people will never do it. Ah, interesting. It, it, it is yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Like, cause I do these office hours occasionally with people who are interested in applying. Right. And they're awesome. They're great. 
And all it takes is like that one meeting where you're just like, you're good enough. You can do it. And that's it. That's so And then they apply. Huh. It's crazy. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things that that Danny's going to run into is sort of like, how do you give that to, like, how do you scale that feeling of like transmitting confidence? It was like, you know, yeah, it's non-trivial. Well, you asked me about podcasts before we started, right? And um, so this is like a crazy side effect of podcasting because it it makes you feel, and the the thing, it it makes you feel like you know someone really well, Um, but the reality is you kind of do. And so that like, that relationship of someone as like, whatever, just like friend or mentor or whatever, Huh. is enough to be like, oh, like I, I kind of get this. I can be myself with them and I can kind of just like express whatever I want to do. But then there are totally like weird elements for me. Like I'll be like in the bathroom at demo day, <laughs> literally. I'll be in the bathroom at demo day and like someone will like tap me on the back and be like, oh man, I like the podcast. Like cool, not now. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, do people feel like they know you from hearing so many of your conversations with others and kind of like how you think about the world? I guess like, because you said that one thing that you find fascinating is like how other people think about the world. Yeah. But I guess like the way that you ask questions must give so much information about how you build models or view systems or how stupid i am um (laughs) yeah no i mean i uh i don't talk a ton about myself i mean i do but yeah it it, people get the sense and i was actually thinking about uh talking to my friend about this this morning of like what is it about the how am i different on the podcast versus in real life because there's there's like some distance for both of us right there's like going to be some dissonance there Right, uh, and I'm curious about like how to best merge the two, um, and I, I haven't figured it out yet because I actually don't know what the what the gap is. It, so you don't know what your podcast. I, I needed. I was I was about to text him and I didn't. And uh, huh, yeah, because I mean you you seem pretty kind of like uh, on the surface similar, but yeah, I guess it would be hard to know without a long period of observation. Oh, have you listened to, to it before? Uh, no, just uh, the content between like, our 15-minute conversation before we started and then kind of like... Oh, right. But I guess yeah. I guess basically it's the same thing. Yeah, maybe. Huh, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Do you I think mean, it'd be better if you were more like the person that you... <laughs> you'd be like, long like, yeah, like what what authenticity do you think would, like, would bring like that? Like you don't have kind of now. I'm curious. So... In some ways, I'm just selfishly interested in like making it something that feels more like me, and it's uh, my, it's see. my thing, right? Um, you're always curious about like gains, you know, what can make the show better, right? And uh, when I think about the podcasts that I like, you know, things like Rogan stuff like that. I mean, obviously, like that's not fringe. But I imagine, and this is again like projecting because I've never hung out with him. Um, I imagine that it's like very close to what hanging out with the person is like. And then when I watch the podcast with me, sometimes I can tell that I'm nervous or not as like, I don't know, natural as normal. Do you think it's the environment? Like if you, if you made this like feel like your living room, (laughs) that it it would be be slightly different or? Um, Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it's totally. I mean, I think one thing that would be beneficial is like hang. I mean, you're this is, you know, you're great. So it's like very chilled. It's very easy. Yeah. But sometimes like uh, hanging out with someone beforehand. Oh, I see. So it feels like you have a conversation and then it just continues into. Yeah. Hmm. And and the uh, my desire to keep it like on topic can make it less natural than it could be. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, because you, you always come back to, like, one thing. But then maybe, like, that's not actually the, the organic way that it would have gone. Right, because, yeah. I mean, like, what well, actually, this will be a good test. Because I'll put this one out and people are like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Stay on topic with the longevity stuff. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, totally yeah. interesting. I don't know. It's tough. Because uh, are you a podcast person? I actually am not. Like, yeah. I, I really only do books and papers because podcasts are kind of annoying like you, you can't fast forward through them easily and kind of like use, use your eyes to like figure out if like they were transcribed then i might read them but yeah which you can i some do we do 
but not everyone. But then I also feel like I don't, I think there's like something about de- being decorrelated, you know, because ev- if everyone's listening to the same podcasts and you go and like spend the same amount of time reading like with people and like <laughs> the Greeks kind of like, you know, yeah. you know like, with, what the cities was thinking, you might have like very outdated information that's like not very informed, you know, about today, but you also might like, I guess, get a similar feel for how somebody was, but have it be like more decorrelated and therefore um, ideally kind of like more... Um, sort of like give, maybe give you like a better viewpoint than the normal i think you should i think it's right. all, like i mean dude the amount of times i've heard people reference sapiens or charlie munger is like i just can't deal i mean <laughs> they're great they're awesome ideas whatever right but like everyone's consuming the same media yeah and, and i think it's interesting because like if you if you don't and you try to understand it from first principles which I think is like, maybe like for, for principles itself being like kind of like, I think that is often cited as like the good thing, but like yeah. maybe not fully understood. Um, it can be like quite different. Like I think one, one thing most people don't realize is like, you know, math and science often are like more artistic than they are kind of like logical, but like everyone's trying to like frame things as like a kind of logical process. So yeah. Well, because it's, I think a counterintuitive thing is that you, well, I mean, it's obvious when you say it out loud to pursue an idea in math or science you have to be inspired to pursue it because you don't know if it's true beforehand. Exactly. <laughs> so, like, no, it's so crazy. Like, uh, like I think it's fascinating. You, you look at Newton, right? Like Newton spent, he had like this amazing year when he was 21. He like discovers all these things. And then he goes into like alchemy and the Bible. And you're like, what? Like, where does that come <laughs> from? But I think part of it is like the kind, I mean, obviously it's something logical and analytical. And, like he has these like books where he's like, so curious. But I think also like he has some kind of like a little bit like a mysticism. Like there's kind of yeah. this weird aspect of it. It's like a little bit artistic. And we kind of like, we forget that. We're like, oh yeah, like scientists are kind of like robots. Um, but they're they're really, yeah, they're, they're really not. Definitely not. Definitely not. All right. So let's actually get to some of these questions. <laughs> okay, uh, Grace. All right, man. So which ones appeal to you? Because we have so many. Um, like, I think the ones that are like factual are good. So just like the, the research questions probably. All right, let's do that. Um. So maybe we should rip through because I, I'm genuinely interested in a lot of these. And I okay. read I read your longevity FAQ, which okay. is awesome. And it's very like um, Tim Urban, Wait But Why style. Right. And maybe yeah. it's the drawings that got me. Yeah. But that was cool. Well, I, I, yeah. Yeah. That must have taken a lot of work. Um, yeah. It's like, you know, just drawing the kind of like axes and then like three lines. It was. Yeah. It was hard. Uh, <laughs> um, so. Sam Batesh asks, do you think there's going to be another step function change in human oh, lifespan yeah. since, you know, germ theory? What's so, the next one? I think this is a super fascinating question and time to be alive um, because like, you know, you know, it really, you know, it, it's fascinating. You, know, you look back and kind of like, you know, germ theory is just like such a huge breakthrough. I think but one thing that I think is lost also is like there's another breakthrough that's similar related, which is that like life comes from life. Yeah. Right? Because like for all history, we think that like, their spontaneous generation of life. Like, literally up until, like, you know, right about that time. And then Pasteur's like, nope, nope, nope. Like, you know, these germs are coming in, like, through, the, like, the neck of the pipe. It's it's not. And so, you know, that, and that was a huge breakthrough. And then, you know, obviously Darwin, kind of, like, you know, also very important. I think the thing that um, we kind of have an intuition will be important in longevity that most people are kind of not paying attention to is, like, what it, it's going to sound way too philosophical, but really when you get into it, I think it's the important thing. What does it mean to be alive? Hmm. Um, and at what point are you, um, kind of differentiating between like the germline, which is kind of like your reproductive cells and the soma, which is kind of like your kind of, um, you know, skin and tissue, because there is a immortal line of kind of like living kind of things that has been replicating since like our first ancestor, right? Transmitted through our, ge- our germline. When, when I have a kid, that kid does not come out and like have the same amount of aging that I do when I have it. It is kind of like brand new, right? Yeah. And like, how the heck does that happen? And and how do you fit that kind of paradigm? And like, and if you take, for example, a bacterium, now there are some bacteria that do asymmetrically divide and like possibly have some form of aging, but kind of like you, you know, do you look at a bacterium and think like that, that thing is aging? Maybe, maybe not. Hmm. Um, and so what is it about multicellularity and kind of like our germline and, and the differentiation between the two that's caused us to kind of evolve or start this kind of like aging phenomenon? And you know, given that, is it natural? Or can we think about how our desire to kind of like live longer ourselves fits into kind of like that differentiation? Because, you know, nature has already solved for kind of like living forever on some level, right, on the cell level. And so kind of what is it about, yeah, our soma that like is so different? And and, and are there any things that we can repurpose and use, um, you know, for that? 
Um, and so I think that that area is going to be super, super fascinating. And then I'm also just broadly in love with the question of like, what is life, right? Kind of like, that's <laughs> so interesting. Like, you yeah. know, Schrodinger in like the 1930s, kind of like writing these fascinating tracks, and like bringing like Maxwell Burke and others in. And so that, you know, that and, and kind of the people thinking about that, like, you know, sort of Jeremy England um, at, you know, at, at MIT are just you know, absolutely incredible in their work. That that's probably sort of a, sorry a longer answer, but like you know we yeah. we just think like I, I love these questions because sort of like you know we spend so much time thinking about like the practicalities, but kind of like the higher level order of like what will be the actual breakthrough. I think that like that that area is just, like really interesting. Sort of tangent. You mentioned um, yeah, giving birth. Is right. is someone working? Or I mean, I assume someone, but like. Are people working on uh, extending fertility windows if you extend yes. health span? Because yeah. that seems like, you know, if you could live forever, right. you know, as a dude, like I can just opt out, right? Like I'm just like, <laughs> all right, I'm not going to have kids or right. I'm not going to like, in my mind, that's the real issue, right? It's like allocating time, yeah. you know? So if we, say you work right. aggressively until you're 30 yeah. or 35 or whenever, and then you have <laughs> kids, like all of a sudden you have to take care of this thing or it will die. Right. Um, so being able to push that till you're sixty, yep, seems like really valuable. Yep. Well, well. So we we think that's that's that is um uh and so uh, sorry, I don't want to say fascinating too many times. It really is a fascinating area <laughs> because you know there are some animals, many in fact, where like you know you have some octopi that lay their eggs and then their mouth disappears. And they're like sitting on their eggs and like literally commit suicide. And if you reverse like glandular action, like gives rise to that, they just keep on living. Whoa. And so it's like you have programs in essence all over the animal kingdom. And like we're, you know, anthropocentric humans. And so we say, oh, that doesn't happen to us. But if you think about menopause, right? Like in women, like what is that? That is a clocked, acute onset of <laughs> yeah. kind of lock, loss of health, right? Not just fertility, like many other things. You get fat redistribution, you get like, you know, bone loss acutely at the time of menopause. So many other things get like a lot worse in a clocked fashion. And you kind of look at other animals and you're like, oh, we're all like that. You know, but, but really, are we that different? Um, and so that area is just... And there are even some hormones that we're looking into right now that are involved in that process that we think hmm. are super fascinating for longevity. And so I, th I think like that area is just, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting. So what, yeah, I mean, is it more, I imagine it's more likely for it to be an artificial womb than re-engineering humans, but maybe that's inaccurate. I, well, so I think the artificial womb sort of area is not one that we necessarily look at because it's sort of like not, you know, if you solve that problem, when it starts to like solve the longevity problem. Right. Um, but I, I think there, there's actually, you know, that would be cool. But like even just thinking about like what is menopause, yeah. right? Because like, you know, yeah. why is it so timed? Like, what is the clock that, like, turns on? And if we, like, turned off that clock, like, would it push backward? Is there some kind of natural? And there, there's some, like, obvious answers for that. But, um, I, you know, it just, it, it really is. And you think of, like, how did evolution decide, like, that was the correct time? Um, so that I think that I was just, like, That's yeah, really, really interesting. That's awesome. Uh, all right. Jason Choi asks, what's the percentage of longevity attributable to lifestyle choices versus genetics and the progress of technology in influencing both? Oh, interesting. So there's a recent paper um, that actually came out, uh, super fascinating by this guy, Yaniv Ehrlich, in Science. And what it did was they have a public database of heredity. So basically, like, fa a family tree. Unfortunately, it doesn't have actual genomic data <laughs> for each person. But you have a lot of lifespan data, so age, um, birth, and, and, and sort of death dates, many generations back. And so you can ask, what is the kind of, like, um, heritability of longevity? You know, if your parents lived longer, are you also likely to live longer? And I think prior to that, we'd had about a 25% heritability kind of figure. I think that dropped to like about 11%. I could be off on this figure, but I think that paper was about 11%. Hmm. Um, could be wrong. And so that, I think that's kind of the current uh, statement from the field is that like that's, you know, our um, prior like percentage of longevity people to genetics. I think that underestimates the potential impact of genetics on longevity because sort of like, you know, do you have kind of like, um, you know, mutants that are like long lived in the population? No. And so maybe, you know, I think it doesn't tell you like how much genes could be changed to influence longevity. Um, but yeah, about 11% would be like the current estimate from the field. Hmm. Okay, there you go. Um, Fatih asks, is blood transfusion, so this is parabiosis. Right, uh, yeah. Is it a thing or just a hoax? <laughs> oh gosh, no, the, the blood boy question. Oh, we, yeah, the I blood know. boys are like our, <laughs> they false around. Um, everywhere we go, we, we're asked about the blood boys. Um, so, so one thing that's fascinating, right, is like, um, sorry, fascinating all the time. Um, if you uh, go back and ask, what are the first ever things discovered to impact longevity? Um, you know, the tools that we had prior to 1950 did not allow us to do genetics. They did not, or in, on the molecular level, they did not, did not allow us to do like any of the things that we, we now kind of focus on longevity. The one thing that you know, Alex Carell in 1912 gets the Nobel Prize for sewing blood vessels together. Um, and so what is one of the things that is tried in the, the early half of like the 20th century? Because like, that's the only thing that we have the tools to do. It's like literally, you know, you're like, you're sewing blood vessels together between a young and an old mouse. Yeah. 
And that does appear to have positive impacts. You know, there, there are three or four Nature and Science papers that have come out recently showing, you know, there's some positive impact on kind of like the function of the brain, some positive impact on function on the heart, some on muscle. Um, and so we do see positive impacts. I, I haven't seen to date a really good longevity study. Um, so I, I think we've seen a lot of evidence of like age-related kind of phenotypes getting better. Yeah. But I personally have not seen a study that like really, you know, makes me super excited about kind of like the, the number of extra years. Lots of stuff to like indicate that, that might be the case if done correctly, but just I actually haven't seen the study, you know, like sort of done yet. Um, th- there's been some studies published like in the mid 1900s about parabiosis um, that I think I might have cited um, that kind of indicated an extension, but they're kind of like really replicated properly to really believe that. And so I think, that, you know, there's probably some impact on lifespan. Like, I don't think we have that well characterized yet. Hmm. Okay. So true, like not a hoax. Not a but hoax. But not really in practice. Could, I think people really overfocus on that because it's such an easy story to tell, right? Like, yeah. oh, vampires. Vampires. Oh, it's all just vampires. Okay, like, yeah, like, <laughs> vampires. And you're like, no, no, no. There's like, you know, 60 different things that make, you know, acts live longer. And like, you have to look at, you know, but people don't want to hear about like daft tunes and receptor. Like, they want to hear about like vampires. Yeah. No, I mean, it's just like, like kind of what I was saying before about like tech being seen as black and white. Like sort of like everything. People yes. just want the pill. Oh, actually, I wanted to talk about rapamycin. Ah, right. Uh, yeah. So my friend Nicola wrote in New York article about it oh awesome and i'm like i'm slightly terrified uh right. but can you can you just break it down um so so rapamycin is this is this um really really uh, interesting drug discovered on rapa nui the isle in a soil sample yeah. as many many drugs were um and you know kind of what it does is uh many things uh, but but i think one thing that's been focused on is its impact on what's called mTOR which is a protein mm-hmm. Um, that's part of kind of two different complexes of proteins. Um, and so, you know, the problem with rapamycin is it has a lot of kind of like Im- side effects, right? It's originally developed as like, you know, maybe immune suppressant in one use. And so do you really want to be taking that like, you know, continuously? Probably not. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of doctors, you know, if you ask kind of like a subset of kind of like people who specialize in crazy things that might actually work in longevity, a few of them will say like pulse rapamycin, so taking rapamycin in very kind of, you know, cute doses, but then like on a schedule, not continuously, is a good thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that like we, we don't see that like being disproven or like implausible. Just kind of like it is, I think, a, a risky endeavor on some level. Um, one thing I would say is, you know, we, there are several companies trying to develop much safer versions that do the same thing. So like have the positive benefit, but, like don't have like all the other kind of like um, sort of negative, negative effects. And so I, I personally just kind of like wait until those like get a little bit farther along. Um, but I mean, it, rapamycin is kind of reported. I think the other fascinating thing is like, I don't think we have a great feeling for what the max is on the lifespan extension that's possible with rapamycin. Yeah. Like the question is like, if you dose it up, like what's the maximum dose and how at, at what point do you start to get like decreasing returns on longevity? I, it's not clear that we've actually hit that barrier quite well. Um, that's the other fascinating like sort of thing. Interesting. What what about, um? I've hear, heard people taking testosterone and like that oh, is debated yes. over like, you um, know, maybe it increases health span, but it actually right. might shorten lifespan. No, we, we get a lot of, and, you know, there's a lot of people talking like we're in a low T society. There's also, I think a lot of people taking growth hormone, um, you know, for longevity. Yeah. And when I first, when I first saw that in kind of like an airplane magazine, I was furious <laughs> because like in worms, if you deep, if you like knock out the analog of growth hormone right. receptor, they live longer. And, and, you know, mice like dwarf mice, are the long-lived mice and like within a species not you know between species but within a species you know being smaller is actually a correlate with kind of longevity um but i think you know one thing there is like maybe taking growth hormone makes an 80 year old feel a lot better so it's kind of like a health span optimization so back to that kind of like you know do you feel better like that results in long lifespan but i, I don't think that's a great thing obviously to do for kind of like actual lifespan yeah. in general because it, to clarify it can inc- uh, increase or encourage like cancer cell growth um, I mean, there's, there's possibly some minor thing there, but I, I think for the most part, um, there's a not fully defined complex signaling pathway um, that seems to kind of uh, be quite related to longevity yeah. that was first discovered in worms and, and then kind of like also characterized in humans. Like there's a subset of dwarfs, for example, um, who appear to, compared to their relatives, suffer much less cancer and metabolic disease. Um, and that correlates with what you expect from mice. Like if you mutate mice yeah. to be dwarfs, they live about 60% longer than normal. Like sixty percent, pretty non-trivial. Pretty solid, right? How much shorter would you be if you could live sixty percent longer? How much shorter? Um, uh, I'm not quantum. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> not like ten percent, obviously, but like you know, between fifty and, and seventy. But 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 I or eighty. I, I'm not actually sure for 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 those mice how qu- much more they were quantitatively. But I think the interesting thing is you can actually possibly decorrelate like the being smaller with yeah. the effect. So uh-huh. it's like not not just like a size thing. It's like a signaling thing as well. Mm. Would you make that trade if you're like? 
Oh, no, so the one foot tall. The, the, the trade is positive. So the, the idea is like you can you can decouple like the being small with like longevity benefits. Oh, I know, so, like, but I'm asking the, you, would you rather? Oh, would I, would I make that trade? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. Probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so Aubrey de Grey, another like kind of famous longevity person. Uh, someone asked about them. So Chris asks. He's mentioned several times about replacing organs with new organic ones before they fail. Is that a reasonable idea or would they more likely be uh, replaced with synthetic ones? Oh, interesting. I think so. This is an area that we're still building our, it's like maybe too late to be like seven years and still thesis building. Yeah. Um, but it, it, I, you know, I think there, there are so many things that have to go right for that to become like the obvious thing to do. Um, you know, I mean, in some ways it's like the oldest version of aging, right? And that like, you know, Back to our friend Alex Carell and his Nobel yep. Prize, where like you know he is doing the first ever kind of like sewing of kind of like the organs and kind of like let's get a you know little if you read his paper that's like let's just grab this like dog kidney and like we'll take this one from this other dog and like you know plug it in and he's just and you're like wow okay that's the early 1900s so in a sense what Aubrey's proposing is the oldest most kind of like worked on um, idea but then you know I, I I think we also we just haven't seen that done well on the rejuvenation front um, a lot recently and I, I think I don't. I think we're still following. You know, there's some things where, like, if you get an organ from somebody who's had cancer, for example, there's like this small risk. Like, ten years later, you might also incur like some kind of negative event. Um, and just things like that. I think I think we're still understanding kind of how to how to weigh those those risks. Okay. But I, I think it's fascinating. It's a surprising fact that it is. You know, it sounds the most futuristic, but it's actually the most kind of like old method of kind of like considering working in the space. Right. Well, you're just like take the part out, put in another. Right. Good to go. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. So. I have a very important question. So Micah said you did a cookie diet. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how did that go? Um, I, I think it was pretty informative in that, uh, you know, again, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody to like go eat just cookies, but. Were um, these like fancy health food cookies? No, no. So, so the reason I did it was my friend had claimed that he had only eaten uh, whipped cream and bacon for a month. <laughs> And that this was possible. <laughs> of course it's possible. Yeah, all right. right. But then he was like, but I actually feel pretty good too. And I thought that it was total BS. And yeah. that he uh, probably, well, I mean, he's a very smart and like, you know, uh, conscientious person. So I was like, well, like either he's like very different than I really thought he was or um, that's possible to do. And so I wanted to test it. And so I tried that and I was like, well, you actually kind of can and you kind of feel fine. Um, and so then I was just like curious, like if you, if you took any random thing, like any random food object, like just ate that for a month, like what would happen? Um and uh, the cookie diet like worked very well, but I just I, for the long term it seemed like probably not a good idea. So switching off of that to like a lower sugar diet is probably a good idea. Did you were you doing blood tests or was all by feel? No, no, I, I should have done blood tests. That's funny. Yeah, there was this um, well known long distance hiker named Andrew Skirka. He's oh, okay. written a bunch of blogs and stuff, and he's uh, pretty well known for having kind of extreme. Like he just has a diet that can take anything. It seems like so huh. he was like interesting. I think for a while it was just like Snickers and Pringles, oh, something like that. That sounds great. Yeah, which I mean, I guess if you have enough toothpaste like on the Pacific Crest Trail, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, you have to kind of wonder though, like how, like how much worse that would be than like one thing for example is right. I think that like a lot of for example eating meat. Maybe the worst part of it is like if your animal was stressed, like had like a lot of the incorrect type of hormone directly before like being killed. But actually, like a more important thing, like whether you're eating meat or not, is sort of like what the kind of like minor things are that we don't think about, like the axes that aren't like explicit, like what, like what those are. But yeah, hard to say. Hard to say. Cool. All right, my last question is: Are you seriously not doing anything really weird? There's like no pills. <laughs> there's no weird food. There's no crazy fasting. Um, I mean, I think that like apart from trying things with the cookie diet. So, so one thing that I, I was trying to do for a while was like I was trying to quantitatively understand, you know, because we're just like black boxes and like you intake some number of calories and like you should be able to calculate like where they, they all go, kind of like how many are necessary to like eat each day, kind yeah. of like from first principles, like figure out kind of like what an optimal diet would be. I tried to do that for muscle. So I was like, like, how many proteins should one eat 30 minutes after working out? The first problem was it's really hard. Like why 30 minutes after working out is the correct amount of time? No idea because sort of like, you know, our cells are expanding during that period of time, but like it's hard to, you know, figure out. Um, also just got really down in the weeds of like how many amino acids would be required to like replace certain things. And, and I think I came out of that just kind of like very convinced, like a lot of the things that like people talk about at a high level, are, like wrong and like provably theoretically still like a, like kind of a lower level. And that like, I shouldn't have the time to kind of like really think about doing that for like <laughs> a full diet. Um, and so I think at this point, uh, until I have like, you know, maybe a full year to kind of like go back and understand that whole area better. Um, it's kind of like just, you know, 
the obvious things because history is probably like a good teacher for like, you know, baseline health. Nice. All right. If someone wants to learn more about you, where should they go? Yes. Um, so we run Longevity Fund uh, and I'm just uh, Laura at longevity.vc and anyone can reach out and we, we love to talk to you. Cool. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. Thank you for having me.